Hello and welcome to this BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT interview. Today I'm with Natasha Perjol, who is from the Department of Computing at Imperial College, and she's the winner of this year's Roger Needham Award. Natasha, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, I've sort of, well, I've read about what you've, your achievements and everything you've done to receive the Roger Needham Award, but I wonder if you could briefly, uh, or go into some detail, explain the work you've been doing and uh, yeah, basically how you've received this award. Um, yes, um, so basically the work that I do is an interdisciplinary computer science work at the boundary of computer science, mathematics, biology and medicine. Okay. Um, it's usually referred to as systems biology, which is part of perhaps computational biology. So basically what we do is we analyze biological systems basically mm -hmm. as a whole rather than just isolated elements such as genes or proteins. Okay. We view the cell uh, as a whole and yeah. then try to figure out uh, the collective behavior of it and what we can learn from it. So basically uh, over the past decade or so biologists, basically bio biotechnologists have advanced to produce large quantities of biological data, mm -hmm. molecular data. Uh, and we need to develop computational tools and mathematical models to harvest information out of those data. So okay. this is what I've been doing. And I'm very grateful to my department at Imperial College who has allowed me to do this work, who uh, had confidence in me that I can do that, and who nominated me okay. uh, for, for this award. And basically without their nomination, I would not have been here today. Okay. So, I mean, what sort of benefits do you, do you hope to, to derive from this research? I, mean, I imagine it will be in the, med in the medical field. Uh, yes. Um, um, a lot of the stuff that we do is we focus on prevalent complex diseases such mm -hmm. as cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, basically diseases that are uh, very prevalent today in the Western world. Mm. Um, in terms of uh, cancer research, we've had a collaboration with um, uh, people from dermatology. Uh, we discovered new members of uh, so-called pathways, which are kind of paths through the cell where signal is transmitted from the surface of the cell to the nucleus of the cell where basically certain genes get turned on to react to the environment. So we basically okay. found new proteins in, that, in those pathways uh, that are involved in melanin production. So basically, which is very uh, important for skin cancer. Mm. So that's one of the things that we have done in the past. Currently, we have an ongoing collaboration uh, with uh, researchers, with medical doctors from Imperial College London, from uh, Hammersmith uh, campus, where we study breast cancer. We already published a paper. We have another paper on the go. So basically, we're trying to understand this disease mm. and uh, hopefully uh, improve healthcare. So I'd imagine, I mean, is this, is this, a, is this a new way of, of looking? You say you, instead of focusing on one bit, you're focusing on the whole bit. Is yes. It, is it a new thing? It is a new thing, actually. It is a fairly new thing. Uh, while previously people would focus on a single gene or a, or a single protein and they would study everything about that, uh, now basically the understanding has come that uh, we cannot... Uh, get full insight into life phenomena unless we observe the whole thing, okay. how it functions, yeah. how it's all related to each other. And so basically mm -hmm. we would have different layers of information that we are collecting about a cell and we need to extract information out of each layer. For example, what do genes tell us? What do proteins tell us? What do mm -hmm. metabolites tell us? And so forth. And then not only extract information out of each layer, but also integrate those layers to get a full picture of a biological system. Because mm. I guess it's, yeah, it's the way that they interact, whereas if you're looking yes. at them in, in isolation, you yes. can make, maybe make changes to that, and, but you need to know the knock-on effect. That's right, that's right. So basically it's similar to, for example, a software system, software call graphs, like functions that call other functions, and you have a patch and you fix something here, and then that propagates somewhere else and breaks something else. I mean, this is a very common thing, right? Mm. So similar happens in biology, and this is uh, basically what I study, what I've been studying for about a decade now, ever since my grad school. Actually, I started uh, in theoretical computer science and mathematics in the branch of mathematics called graph theory. Graphs or networks are basically elements and the relationships between them. So a network is, it can be a social network of people, for example, you know, people are nodes and then edges 
are friendships between them. So similarly in the biological system, we have proteins as nodes, as individual elements, and then because they're three-dimensional molecules, so they have a three-dimensional structure, and if they are in proximity and they can bind to each other, then we put an edge, and then through this binding, they change their three-dimensional conformation and do something in the cell. Mm -hmm. So basically, you can represent all of these proteins as nodes, as a large network of nodes, and all of these interactions at edges. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure out what's happening with them collectively. Like what information is hidden? Is this structure of the network, or as we call topology, is it random? Well, of course it's not random because natural selection has added, acted on it okay. and it's designed to do a particular purpose. And this, this is what we are trying to figure yeah. out, you know, yeah. what is by design and, and why and how it works. Yeah, and uh, you, you mentioned the one thing you, you found about the way, the way that the, um, the cell sort of, uh, the, the signal goes through the cell. What other sort of things have you found that has surprised you in this sort of research? Ah, oh, that surprised me. Uh, so, th the thing is that dealing with these large networks is computationally intractable, mostly. So basically there are some simple algorithms, but usually they don't apply to real-world data. Real-world data is complex and many of the problems are so-called NP-hard and NP-complete, meaning that mathematically, probably, you cannot solve them exactly right. given all compute power of the universe yeah. and yeah. all the time of the universe, yeah. right? Yeah. So what we need to do is we still want to, to solve these problems, so we need to design approximate solutions or heuristics. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that uh, is perhaps surprising, and this is a new paper that we will be publishing hopefully later this week, or it, it, it's accepted, so mm -hmm. I don't know exactly when it'll come out this week or next week, or but, but very soon, is that in uh, biological systems and actually in, in other systems, uh, uh, any networks like uh, economic networks, world mm -hmm. trade networks, mm -hmm. metabolic networks, protein interaction networks, in all networks you can identify a very small number of roles that these nodes play mm -hmm. and it is the interaction between these node roles that can give you insight into the functioning of the system and what okay. it means. Yeah. So yeah. that's a new insight that I thought it was very surprising. Basically, we can compute this very quickly and we get some beautiful results. For example, we can track uh, the, the origins of economic crisis, recovery periods, what impacts them, which countries get the most impacted, right. why, and, and things like that. So yeah. I thought that was probably surprising yeah yeah i would think so no you, you were saying a, a, a little bit briefly that um the way that obviously by not isolating things uh, you can get the knock-on sort of effect yes so would this lead to um could you use your your research in sort of um uh, pharmaceutical research yes. creating drugs and and yes. sort of trying to minimize uh, not sorry minimize the side effects but maybe yes. have forewarning of the side effects Yes, uh, yes, that is a very interesting question and the pharmaceutical industry is very much interested right now right. in exploiting actually these networks and trying to figure these things out. In particular, one of the uh, big topics right now in pharma industry is how to reposition the drugs. So basically, you know, pharma has synthesized most of the drugs that it actually can synthesize. Of course, at the university, a good chemist can synthesize more. I mean, the, the universe of possible drugs is, yeah. is huge. But pharma would like, basically, to figure out a way if they can reposition as drugs. So for example, just a trivial example, like maybe a, a, a headache medicine is not just a headache medicine. Maybe it does something in kidney disease, mm -hmm. okay? so. Uh, right now, what we are trying to figure out is how to integrate and harvest information out of all of these networks, layers of information that we have about genes, proteins, metabolites, mm -hmm. drugs, drug target, drug-drug interactions, mm -hmm. uh, interactions between diseases, ontology of, of genes, of basically what they do in the cell and proteins. Can we uh, harvest all that information to help us understand so-called disease ontology. Mm. So basically, currently, the way medical doctors are learning about diseases and relationships between them, meaning disease ontology, mm. that knowledge has been about 100 years old. Mm -hmm. It's based only on the symptoms they knew back yeah. then and the organs the most affected, mm. but back then they did not have all this molecular level data. Yeah, of course, right. So now a big challenge is 
how do we harvest this information and then to evaluate if this disease ontology still holds of course a large chunk we expect will hold mm. but there would be other relationships between diseases mm. that we might be able to exploit to just reposition the drugs because if you're repositioning that you know you know it's not toxic you know yeah. you know like it's already the yeah. research is done yeah. you can just yeah. Give it to no, different group of people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the beautiful problems right now. And yeah. uh, I've been working with GlaxoSmithKline, actually. I'm very grateful to them. They've been uh, funding a couple of my students in the past. Uh, and we've published a paper uh, in December on one of the methods how to uh, figure things out, figure mm -hmm. these relationships, new relationships between mm -hmm. diseases. And, of course, it's an ongoing uh, uh, work. Yeah. Now, obviously, you're, you're dealing with probably huge amounts of data big data, which is obviously a, a big challenge for a lot of companies now, the amount of data that's been created. I mean, how, how do you find that you, that you in, your, in your field, cope with the sheer amount of information that's coming out of your research? Yes, there is the amount inf of information, there is a lot of data, that is true, uh, but in addition to the amount of data, there is the complexity in the yeah, data. Of course. So that's a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. So we basically, you know, we can use all the compute power that's given to us yeah. right uh, i got an erc starting grant a couple of years ago so we bought a decent compute cluster just for my groups just mm -hmm. on which we can develop these algorithms and yeah. test them and yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh yeah there are challenges and you know we cope with them by parallelizing mm -hmm. of course you know you know Luckily, many of the problems that we deal with are embarrassingly parallel, so we can just distribute uh, mm -hmm. over a cluster, then collect the data, yeah. uh, you know, integrate them a bit. Uh, so that's one of the ways we cope. Of course, there are, there are challenges such as you know, if your networks is network or networks are too large to fit in the memory, how do you partition a network? We still don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, which chunk do you put in memory yeah. to actually process it? Mm, we're working on that. But yeah, they're, they're big computational problems here. Yeah, yeah, because I imagine, I mean, this, the sort of work you're doing mm -hmm. before, it was, it was it, the reason I imagine it hasn't been done before, it's just the compute power hasn't been there until now. So, I mean, your sort of work is pushing the boundaries of, of computing performance, I would imagine. Yes, yes, actually. Um, it's the data was not there, uh, but even with the data, the compute power is not there. Uh, even with the compute power that we have, it's still a challenge. You know, we, we have to really parallelize, we have to figure all sorts of things out. Can we do it in hardware? How do we do it in hardware? You know, uh, th there are many, many issues here. So absolutely, this is uh, computer science. This is definitely computer science. Without computers, you cannot solve these problems. No. You know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like a human genome. Everybody now knows about the human genome. You know, it's a string of letters. And imagine having a book of, like, human genome. You cannot just kind of flip through it and figure yeah. things out. You have to compute. You have to model. You have to figure things out. And even the genome, we don't really understand. And the genome is just the pl blueprint of the so-called proteome. Genes make proteins. And it's proteins that do things in the cell. Mm. So, and we're trying to understand, you know, how genes interact and how proteins interact. So you can... You know, you, you can imagine what, what levels of complexity are there, and mm -hmm. and you really need to utilize compute power, or yeah, yeah you can't do it. No. Obviously, BCS uh, has a very active health informatics group, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you're aware of. Now, what are the what do you see as the the biggest challenges in terms of uh, health informatics using your computers in, in healthcare? Mm, yeah, health informatics. Yeah, well, that's um, uh, another uh, issue. Uh, so in health or informatics, of course, privacy is a great issue. Uh, getting access to the data is a big issue. And then, of course, what do you do with those data? How do you compute on these patient data, patient records? Again, it's the same types of problems that we talked about earlier in the interview where you have different layers. So, for example, you would have I don't know, cardiovascular patients, for example. You'd have uh, their symptoms. You'd have their, uh, you know... Um, um, data such as if they're smokers, their weight, mm -hmm. their, their habits, if there's exercise, if they don't exercise. Then you would have molecular data. Uh, uh, for example, if, if they were operated on, maybe a plaque was removed, so that would be sent uh, for analysis, you'd have that. Then you would have post-operational, whether there were complications or not. Uh, you would have how the person reacted to certain medicine, whether the person got better and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. 
And then imagine about each person you have, you have all this data. Mm. First of all, how do you integrate that data even to figure things out for one patient? Yeah. And second, if you have a bunch of these patients, how do you uh, integrate all of this knowledge, model it, to figure out the next patient when the patient comes, which drug you should give to that patient, mm. whether you should operate or not, whether you can predict complications. Mm. Um, so these are some of the problems that we are actually dealing with. We yeah. con my group is constantly working with medical doctors. We do have luckily access uh, to some electronic patient records. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I think this is a big field. This is a huge challenge. And if we can do this uh, right, there, there could be huge improvements in healthcare. So one thing I read um, a few years ago in relation to um, disease treatment is that, um, say you've got somebody in the UK who's got lung cancer and you've got somebody in the US who's got a similar form of lung cancer. Now, is there you know, the way in which the person in the, the physician in the UK can know that the, per, the, the physician in the US has used this particular drug and it's had a particular effect and they could, it's almost, it'd be useful if they could use that information for the benefit of that patient. But it's obviously, you know, medical, uh, records, people are incredibly sensitive about, and rightly yes. so in many cases. Yes, yes, and the big difference is between how that's handled in Europe versus mm. how that's handled in the US. In particular, I haven't worked about these protocols and standards, how you handle them, mm. so that's not really what I do, what I've done. Yeah. What I do is like once I have access to these data, how can we use those data to do science? Mm. Let's model them, let's compute on them, and let's make predictions, let's gain an understanding of why things happen, how they happen, and what to do for the next patient. But of course, I go to conferences all the time where this is dis discussed. I, I went to a conference in January, it was in the US, of where exactly there was a debate. Uh, basically, uh, there was a presentation about how it was done in the US, and then of course there were European researchers there who had done it in Europe, and they were asking questions, why do you do it this way, why not yeah. that way? Yeah. So there is a debate, you know, how to do it, but you know, sending things across the ocean, it's very sensitive, I'm yeah. not sure. <laughs> well, exactly, I mean, we have enough data being lost just uh, you know, all the time without adding to it, I suppose. It's almost, I mean, think of it from a personal point of view, if, if, there was, if it could be truly anonymized, perhaps, I mean, if it meant that I received a better um, level, level of healthcare off the back of it, I, I'm just thinking, then I would be happy with it, but you know, it's obviously the level of anonymization and whether it's you know, tracing it back. And That's right, and, and the trust that people have in organizations that collect these data, mm. you know? Mm. Is the data really be used the way they say it's going to be used, or yeah. are they going to be recording this and maybe using it against me when I apply for the next job? You know, if I had a stroke or not. You know what I mean? People yeah. are worried about all these mm. things. So yeah. there are big ethical issues, yeah. sociological and issues. And another thing I've heard recently, you know, you've got these little sort of Fitbit things, uh, little uh, devices you can wear, which track how many steps you take and all that sort of thing. Um, and there's, there's talk about them with the sort of Internet of Things sending all your information back yes. to your doctor and your yes. doctor then passes it on to your insurance company and says, oh, he ran 10 miles, we'll knock 10 pounds off his, off his life insurance or something like yeah. that. I mean, there's all those sorts of things that, are, that could be coming, I suppose, which is just fraught in many ways. Exactly, exactly. Uh, even some friends of mine, you know, they would, I don't know, cycle, I don't know how many miles, and then automatically that device would post that onto Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. and it's like, what are you doing? I mean, why, why are you doing this? So there are big issues. I think we are just at the dawn of this era, and there are so many things that we need to regulate, actually, mm -hmm. to do this right and, and to convince people it's all done properly and it's safe and it's not going to be abused, yeah, yeah. Again, used against them. Now, another issue that BCS is uh, very keen is, is on to, to encourage more women to mm -hmm. go into IT and into computing, and obviously, mm -hmm you working in the uh, Imperial College. How do you find it, the number of women in IT and how, how do you think we could maybe get more women into IT? Uh, uh, yes, uh, another hard question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can say that Imperial, I've been very happy. Uh, at the Department of Computing, we have a relatively large percentage of women compared to other departments, I mean other computing departments in the world. Mm. Uh, the atmosphere is great for working. I've never had any problems because no, of that. It's imagine. it's great. Yeah. It's really good. I mean, I'm very, very happy where I am. But of course, in the past, I've gone through uh, situations where that was not the case. Right. 
and uh, it is difficult. I can say that it is difficult, especially for young women getting into the area because they can feel that everything is against them, yeah. that their colleagues are against them, that the professors are against them, and, and, and you know, there are mechanisms to hope, there are often support groups, women support groups, and that, that does help. How do we solve these problems? Honestly, I have no idea. I know there are people who do research in this area, they, they study basically from the dawn of computing till now, what mm -hmm. has happened and how, how, apparently in the 80s from whatever, I don't really follow this literature very closely, but in the 80s, uh, uh, it was the best period, there, were, there was the largest okay. number of women in computing. Yeah. And then over the 90s and, and, and uh, till now, that declined again. Mm -hmm. Um, it's again also about the image that this profession has and you know yeah. women don't want to be seen as nerds and you know like yeah. they don't want to hang out with those guys who like you know uh, are like that so what to do I don't know perhaps probably you know outreach yeah. probably perhaps an interview such as this one uh, that could show women that you can be a woman and you can do this and it's yeah. all right yeah. uh, Yes, I mean, it will be difficult, but for men, it is difficult as well, yeah, yeah. you know, without being, and if, without being challenged, actually, you cannot achieve this. Yeah. So honestly, I mean, if I was to do it again, I'd probably choose the same path, even yeah. though it is difficult. It's not impossible. Yeah. There is a number of us. Yes, there are social problems, uh, societal problems that need to be addressed, resolved, but people are working on it. And I think as a society, we are getting there. Yeah. Do you think maybe is uh, obviously with the, um, the the large and rapid adoption of IT over the last few years, the things of smartphones and Facebook mm. and Twitter and things like that? Do you think as it becomes ever more pervasive in our society, people will just it will just be something that people do, and it won't necessarily be thought of as a nerdy or a geek thing. It will just be another factor and part of our culture. Uh, yes, I think so. I think you're totally right. And this is what has happened to many other disciplines. Yeah, when it's new, yeah, uh, it's when... Same with engineering yeah. and medicine Yeah, and exactly, exactly. So men first get in, uh, and then slowly women start getting in, and then at some point there would even be more women in the area yeah. uh, then. So, so I think, yeah, it, it will happen. It's just like any other profession, it, it will happen. Yeah, yeah, because it's quite new, I suppose. Yeah. But, uh, um, do you find, I mean, obviously, the, you do get um, a lot of female uh, uh, doctors and, and, and yeah. other sort of physicians. Do you find that maybe in your sort of field where it is more on the biological side, there are more women, did you say? Yes, in bioinformatics, yes, there would be more women. Uh, yeah, because you need to know some biology, you maybe sometimes you even had undergrad in, in biology and then you mm. did master's or PhD in, in bioinformatics. Mm. There are definitely more women in the area, and from what I see from my grad students, usually about half of them would be women. Mm. So, so far I had the four PhD graduates, two women, two men. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, definitely more, I would mm. say, than in some other kind of hardcore computer science areas, such yeah. as systems or uh, compilers, programming languages, things like that, yeah. So, um you, you, well, I'm sure you haven't finished what you're doing or what you're working on. So wh where, where do you hope to, to, to take your research next? Where, what you, what's your next big <laughs> thing? Next big thing? Uh, or small thing or <laughs> medium-sized thing? Yeah, uh, there are many problems. As I told you, these things that we're working on, they're not done deals. No. Uh, so there's still many challenges. I hope to keep improving our methods because what we do is we design methods that work well on a particular problem. Mm -hmm. So this is how you achieve good heuristics. Basically, you cannot do a method that's generic. If you're dealing with a computationally intractable problem, you cannot do a method that works well in all situations. It's, it's mm -hmm. going to fail somewhere. Mm -hmm. But basically, on a particular data set, you, know, you want it to, to work well. So what I would like to do next, I would like to get a little bit more into this health informatics, into electronic patient records, try to predict complications, mm -hmm. try to mm -hmm. figure those things out. Also drug repositioning, um, also working with pharmaceuticals perhaps to figure out how we can do non-invasive testing, mm -hmm. uh, do some, you know, identify biomarkers from blood samples mm -hmm. rather than biopsies of certain tissues. Mm -hmm. Uh, things like that. So that's in the biological realm. Also recently uh, I got interested in uh, economic systems, economic networks, mm -hmm. world trade networks, financial networks. 
uh, how that all works together. Um, and we do have some results there. And basically, this persistent economic crisis over the past few few years, uh, you know, made me curious what's happening there, and can we transfer some of our knowledge mm -hmm. uh, and methods into that domain? Yeah. And uh, I would like to to pursue some of the topics uh, in that area as well. Okay, fantastic, brilliant, Natasha. Thank you ever so much for your time. It's really, really interesting. Thank, thank you, you very much, much for inviting thank you. me.